Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and for mostly being awake. Um, I would like to thank the two Paolos for uh, putting together this wonderful event. It has been so far quite extraordinary. Um, I hope not to lower the tone. Um, a, f a couple of weeks ago, a friend was talking, Dan Smith, in fact, was uh, talking about the possibility of uh, virtuoso philosophy. Um, and we couldn't figure out whether or not such a thing was possible. But after listening to and watching Paolo play last night, I have to say that um, it's something to aspire to. Uh, I don't know if he got a, a proper round of applause at the end, but my God, what a, a fabulous uh, musician. And I think, you know, in addition to listening to the music, I thoroughly enjoyed watching you play. I've, I have never seen anyone except maybe a three-year-old enjoy what they were doing as much as you did, so it was quite wonderful. Thank you. Um, in contrast to Anne, uh, I'm going to risk being boring. Um, and the, talk of, the title of my talk, in fact, is called The Disappearance of Boredom. Um, now, interestingly, I originally wrote this piece as a catalogue essay for the Scandinavian artists uh, Michael Elmgreen and Inga Dragset for a show that they had in Seoul this year called Aeroport Mil Plateau um, at the Samsung uh, Museum of Art. Uh, interestingly, they rejected it, um, I think not because it was boring, um, but you'll be the judge of that, but rather because it didn't speak enough to the themes that they wanted to speak to. Um, but to me, it, it kind of said some things that uh, had kind of occurred to me as being important about art. And that really is the question of, of what it means to be boring. Um, and you, know, you may think that this is kind of a, a strange kind of topic, but one of the things that has really struck me over the last few years of teaching, particularly in the era of PowerPoint, is that boredom has become delegitimated. Uh, you're not allowed to be boring anymore. If you are boring, there's something wrong. If what you're trying to tell people is difficult to grasp, then it's your fault, uh, and you're not allowed to have difficult ideas and certainly not allowed to have difficult pedagogy. Uh, and so it seems to me that this thing that we think of as boredom uh, has disappeared and has become culturally delegitimated, uh, and we should ask some questions about that. Now, I imagine I'm not the only person here who is slightly jet-lagged. Uh, we certainly know that Anne was. Um, and that for many of us, getting here was a matter of um, getting on an aeroplane and passing through airports. So the other part of my talk, which uh, was again part of the original brief, was to connect the idea of airports and the idea of art galleries and think about art in this age of global mobility. So no other public building excites as much fear and anxiety as an airport. No other public building uh, more acutely um, exemplifies Sartre's cruel judgment that hell is other people. Unless, of course, you fly first class all the time, uh, which I don't, so. It is a leviathan space in which everyone fights tooth and claw not to be held up and forced to wait. Now that the online universe of working, shopping, banking, and indeed living has created smooth spaces for us to conduct our lives without ever having to encounter another actual human being. The airport is, the one, is one of the last places in the first world where crowds are still encountered and queuing is still a necessity. Uh, entertainment complexes such as art galleries, movie theatres and theme parks are the only other places where anyone is likely to queue. And it was, of course, the queue that denoted the disintegration of society into seriality for Sartre. Experienced travellers know that there is something far worse to fear than mere queuing, uh, namely delayed or cancelled flights, such as uh, our poor friends on Lufthansa flights over the last few days. Uh, but it is essentially the same anxiety, the fear of waiting and more especially the corresponding fear of boredom that waiting will entail. But as Frederick Jameson once argued, boredom is a very useful instrument with which to explore the past and to stage a meeting between it and the present. It is, however, a species of experience that is vanishing rapidly. Indeed, in some quarters, it has already passed into extinction. Good riddance, some would say. But we must ask, what does it say about a culture if it loses the art of waiting? Does that not mean we who make up this culture no longer know how to amuse ourselves with only our inner selves for company? Now, not everyone is equal before the law of the queue, the cultural elite use their wealth or star status or both to exempt themselves from standing in line, from having to be in someone else's moment and endure bare time unfolding. Now, I use bare here in Agumban's sense of bare life 
to mean time that can be wasted but not spent. The difference between these two conceptions of time can be seen quite clearly in the different ways time is experienced by the rich and the poor. The wealthy don't wait their turn. Their time must be spent, not wasted. By contrast, the starkest index of poverty is the necessity to queue. Whether it is for food, water, or relief from illness, the poorer you are, the more you are forced to wait, to have your time wasted. This is the stick conservative politicians use to beat down both the idea and the reality of socialised medicine, wherever that still exists. If you can afford to jump the queue, then you should be able to. Uh, this is the argument, regardless of any inequality that that may entail. But not just any money will do. It has to be the right money. Foreigners and racial or religious others should not expect the same consideration. Power manifests itself then as the right of selection, the right to say who the right kind of person is in the 21st century. The ultimate status still now uh, and proof positive Walter Benjamin's thesis that there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism is a magical pass card that gives you an express passage through biopower's bio turnstiles. Check in luggage, check in, drop off your luggage, security, health screen, customs, and so on are all just me so many metaphors for how life is today in the full spectre of late capitalism. Now, one might expect art galleries to be the exact opposite of airports, uh, soothing rather than anxiety-inducing, contemplative rather than agitated and hurried, but in fact the, dissimilar the dissimilarities are melting away faster than the polar ice caps. All the major art galleries now are every bit as fortified as airports with the same security rigmarole exacted on all its visitors. As for the actual space of the gallery, it too has become airport-like. As one can readily see at the Louvre, as one passes from Ian Pei's pyramid to the older classical parts of the building, their pyramid is such a bland, featureless, it could be anywhere space, one struggles to discern the difference between the gallery entrance and the metro exit it is connected to. The final form of this reconfiguration of the gallery from ornate temple to the old arts uh, to versatile box is the Frank Gehry designed Guggenheim in, Bil in Bilbao. The exterior of the building has so triumphed over and completely supplanted the interior that visitors now go there for the architecture, not the art. Uh, its collection, which is drawn from Guggenheim's magnificently vast holdings, is not even advertised as a feature or reason why you should go there. In fact, it could be utterly empty, a giant hangar space or maybe just a coffee shop, and people would still go there to witness its shape. Now, airports and art galleries then are nodal points in the vast, smooth space created to serve the so-called transnational cultural elite. In Deleuze and Guattari's terms, they are recipro reciprocally presupposed. Airports need destinations to connect to and a constant supply of new reasons to travel, and galleries need a constant stream of visitors that no local population base is large enough to sustain. This is especially true of the speculative edifices like Bilbao's Guggenheim and Abu Dhabi's Louvre, both of which cost an absolute fortune to build and establish, but it is also true of the major metropolitan galleries such as the original Guggenheim uh, and Louvre. It is perhaps logical then that airports should experiment with incorporating galleries into their own space, uh, as Schiphol did recently uh, in partnership with the Rijksmuseum. For the most part though, airports tend to be content with the odd piece of folk art meaning any artwork whose function is to express the originality and authenticity of a place, irrespective of its actual artistic or heritage value or provenance. This leaves more space for retail, which points to another line of convergence. All public buildings are becoming shopping malls. The day will come when art galleries mothball their art and give over their total floor space to shops uh, and souvenir stores as airports have done, if art is to be viewed at all, it will be done online or on giant screens. And no one will notice, much less bemoan the change, because when not shopping, they'll be glued to their mobile digital devices. And this is the third strand of my talk, which also picks up on a resonance with Anne uh, and the, the, the centrality of the mobile phone. Now, malls have become their own kind of meccas, consumerist sites of pilgrimage, which is doubtless why airports have transformed themselves into malls too. 
to journey from Terminal 5 at Heathrow to London Westfield, for example, is to experience the shock of changing location without changing place. Indeed, as Marco J might put it, it is ex to experience the very absence of place or to enter what he called a non-place. In fact, a similar experience can be had visiting almost any major city, literally anywhere in the world. Admittedly, it is more challenging in mega cities like Delhi and Mumbai or Chongqing and Shanghai, shot through as they are with vast slums. But even there, if one has sufficient means, one can travel in a protected bubble from airport to hotel to mall to office park and never set foot in the real city, never breathe in its dust and smells, never see its dark and dilapidated side. The standardising influence of capital, capitalism has been much remarked upon, but the process is now so ad, far advanced that we're in danger of forgetting how cities used to be. George Ritzer wittily coined the term McDonaldization to describe the process whereby cities everywhere seem to be shedding their distinctive local characteristics in favour of mass-produced global characteristics. But perhaps Jameson was nearer to the mark with his caustic description of the spread of corporate bland as being like an outbreak of toxic moss. Now, if anything can stop the mauling of the world, it will be the smartphone. Uh, and I imagine every one of you has one. Um, I read recently one of those fabulous statistics which claims that there are more smartphones in the world than toilets. Uh, I don't know who actually counts these things up. I mean, who compiles these statistics? But it's a nice one to think about. Uh, and when you think about cell phone usage, they've done uh, research in the US recently, um, and cell phone usage is kind of akin to cigarette smoking. Uh, more than 80% of people, the first thing they do when they wake up is check their cell phone. Um, for people who do addiction studies, if somebody has a cigarette, uh, immediately upon waking, you, you more or less abandon them as being someone you could never get to quit. Uh, and so clearly cell phones have fallen into that category. The other statistic I really like is they interviewed uh, 1,000 under 25-year-olds, and more than 80% of them expressed the idea that they would feel anxious if their phone was in a different room to them. <laughs> uh, and I remember reading some years ago that Coca-Cola had the global ambition that they would have a can of Coke within two metres of every person on the planet. And that seemed outrageously ambitious, but cell phone manufacturers would just laugh at that. I mean, two metres? My God, most people feel anxious if their phone is two metres away. Um, you know, we're now sort of thinking about how can we get it implanted into our arms so we never have to lose it at all. <laughs> so the cell phone is transforming both how we use and how we experience space, and at the same time shaping the kinds of spaces that we need, which ultimately may not be the kinds of spaces that we want. The huge increase in online shopping that has occurred over the past decade or so has placed enormous pressure on bricks and mortar retail of all kinds. In some cases, even driving big box stores like uh, Borders and so forth out of business. No one can predict where this trend will end, but it is clear that there will be more casualties as global shopping practices change. One effect of this uh, that is having a noticeable impact on the urban environment, particularly on the suburban fringe areas, is that warehouses are now replacing shopping malls. Uh, online re retailers like Amazon don't need or want a shopfront, although that's uh, not strictly true since they've recently opened a bookshop, which is kind of surprising. But nonetheless, what they need is vast distribution centres, which uh, Amazon calls fulfilment centres, uh, capable of processing thousands of orders per day. They're also making increased use of robot, robot technology to fulfil these orders, thus further reducing the human presence in these doer places. If all or even most of our shopping moves online, the city will be a very different space. Uh, and anyone who's been to Kuwait will know that what has happened in Kuwait is that the shopping malls, nobody buys things from shopping malls now, so they buy everything online. Uh, so they've kind of had to figure out what the hell to do with their shopping malls. So they've started to convert them into kind of like giant indoor uh, coffee shop kinds of places uh, to sort of, you have now this kind of postmodern um, replacement of the old silks. Uh, those who despair, despair at the dreary uniformity of the strip mall will find themselves nostalgic for their tasteless exteriors when they're replaced by the vacant grey walls of warehouses. The city remade as a distribution centre will be the final triumph of the image because it will mean that the image of the thing has replaced the thing itself. Now, we would only tolerate this if we weren't paying attention, if our gaze wasn't directed elsewhere, and that is precisely what is happening. The smartphones, small screens, have enacted a vast capture uh, of attention. 
Now, apparently in China they're thinking of putting in a special lane so people can walk like this. <laughs> and already people have been killed because they've walked like this in front of cars. Um, you know, death by technology, not exactly how we thought it was going to happen. Um, now, smartphones, are, uh, as I said, they're not only just transforming space, but they're also transforming time. Uh, and this returns me to my theme of our apparent loss of ability to wait. The siren song of consumer capitalism, which disguises itself as entertainment, grows louder in our unstopped ears with each passing day. Like the great traveller Odysseus, we do not try to avoid the siren's fateful music, but unlike him, we assume our freedom, our sense of ourself as autonomous agent, will protect us from its deadly melody. So that's a reference uh, to Adorno and Horkheimer's discussion uh, of, of the siren song. But their analysis, they said that... Um, Odysseus knew that the siren song would be dangerous, so he had himself restrained, um, but, so he couldn't respond to it, but he wanted to listen to it. And they had all his crew stuff their ears so they couldn't hear it and therefore wouldn't respond to it. But I think, unlike him, we just kind of give in to it. We think we're strong enough to uh, deal with the siren song and not be seduced by it. Um, in contrast, then, to the poor, benighted schizophrenic, unable to stop the voices in their head, we invite them in. We let them crowd out our heads to such an extent we forget ourself and we're grateful for the loss, as though it was ourself that was tedious uh, and not the place we're trapped in. One of the most interesting things to me about uh, music, and particularly recorded music, is that when Edison invented the record, and the reason why it's called a record, is that he thought he had invented uh, a device for offices, that people would use them to record their meetings, um, and then file them away. And, and that's what he thought he had invented. And of course, it was boring as hell. Nobody wanted to use it. No one wanted to listen to their own voice. Um, and then somebody had the genius idea of putting music on it. And suddenly, music was available everywhere in the world. And it's hard to kind of get your head back to a moment in time when you couldn't have music to listen to any time you wanted to, anywhere, under any conditions. But that, in a way, is the best way to think about what technology has done. It's transformed the possibility of experiences, released all these kinds of uh, new voices into the world. And, and one of the things that I think Watari talks about that is, to me, the most interesting is the notion of expression. Uh, and it's, it's very rarely talked about in the secondary literature, but one of the things that he says about, about music, about art, is that it enables expression, not the expression of the artist, but the expression of the person who wants to listen to it. You've asked yourself, what do I get out of the music? Why do I listen to it? Why does that song matter to me so much? It's because it expresses or it enables you to express something from within. So that's what I mean then about the voices. We let them in. I don't want this to be understood as negative. I just wanted to kind of acknowledge the fact that contemporary existence means there are voices all the time in our heads, voices from advertising, from music, from TV. We've got billboards shouting at us all the time to buy things. Quite an extraordinary experience. So we let these voices into our heads. We're almost grateful uh, for the fact that we can forget ourselves in the process and, and again, this is kind of something that's advertised a lot. You know, I wanted to get away, I wanted to forget myself. And it's quite strange that our self is presented to us as something that we need to forget and to get away from. And that, in a sense, is the reality and the tragedy of contemporary life. Now, nowhere is that truth felt more keenly than in an airport departure lounge where waiting is widely considered to be a torture. But contrary to the popular view... I want to say that it isn't torture because it is boring. I want to say it is torture because boredom is no longer possible. We embrace our electronic thraldom and thank the gods for the fact we've con conquered boredom once and for all, forgetting that this means we can now never be, as Siegfried Krakauer once put it, as thoroughly bored with the world as it ultimately deserves. By conquering boredom, consumer capitalism has extinguished its most potent critic, Boredom is our defence against the present. And you remember that's what Deleuze said, what we need more than anything is a defence against the present. And, and boredom was that defence. Now, Krakow's diagnosis was made in 1924 when newspapers and magazines were the dominant media forms and cinema and radio were still in their infancy, albeit maturing rapidly. TV had yet to be invented and, of course, the internet was more than half a century away. But already the idea of an unbearable form of bare or non-mediated time was being promulgated. 
Already, there was too much going on. Looking back, we might think of this early period in the history of mass media that it was much less intense in its effects than our own media-saturated universe uh, today. But that fails to grasp just how radical the media form was to those who encountered it then, many for the first time in history. Krakow's contemporary, Walter Benjamin, was especially clear-eyed in this regard. He argued that the form of newspapers, particularly the way stories render the flow of experience um, as events punctuated a sequence of things that happened, i.e. pure information, was such that it could not be assimilated as experience um, by its readers. Today, the crawl of seemingly random headlines that trace their way across the bottom of the TV screen during a news bulletin is a powerful reminder of the truth of Benjamin's thesis. Watching the crawl cannot by itself give rise to experience. Its very structure is alienating. Uh, and I, here I quote Benjamin. He says, The principles of journalistic information, freshness of news, brevity, comprehensibility, and above all, lack of connection between the individual news items contribute as much to this as does the makeup of the pages and the paper's styles. Uh, end of quote. Now, the net effect of this was something that Benjamin called shock. Now, Benjamin frames his discussion of shock in two ways, both of which are relevant today as we try to think about the impact of digital media on our daily lives, i.e. not as a source of misinformation or distraction, but as a formative agent shaping our very subjectivity. To begin with, he frames it historically, arguing that each new mode of communication competes with the one that came before, and in doing so increases the atrophy of experience by moving further and further away from original story forms, by which Benjamin seemed to mean something like myth, but he is not particularly clear on that. He charts a shift from narration to information to sensation and suggests that it is only narration, the story form, that can be assimilated as experience. This is because the storyteller has already embedded what they want to say in their own life, thus rendering it as experience from the outset. Now, the second frame that Benjamin constructs is drawn from Freud, specifically Freud's essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, although he doesn't really want to deal with it in any Freudian way. He also draws heavily on Bergson and Proust, particularly the latter's concept of involuntary memory. Freud helps Benjamin to explain an apparent anomaly in the history of media, namely its increasing propensity to shock as each new media form distances itself from storytelling. Now, one may wonder why each new media form should want to follow this trajectory, since at first glance it would seem as though this would be increasingly off-putting to its potential audience. Now, Benjamin doesn't address this issue directly, strangely enough, but one may suppose that it has to do with the needs of advertisers who have an obvious vested interest in producing shock. They want their products to be memorable, which means they want it to penetrate the veil of the conscious. But more than that, they want to insinuate the desire to buy at a level below or somehow beyond the reach of the conscious mind. Their ultimate goal is to program the unconscious so that buying something, in fact, one can just say shopping in general, is regarded as a pleasurable end in and of itself. And in this regard, they have been spectacularly successful. Shopping, one might say, is the dominant cultural activity today. Now, if you doubt this, uh, I just ask you to perform a simple experiment. Imagine a visitor coming to stay with you from a city other than your own, and you try to draw up a list of things that you're going to do. Uh, and somehow, depending on the city that you're living, uh, shopping always seems to be pretty much at the top. If you live in a city in Australia, for example, there's pretty much not much else you can do besides shop. And if you live in glorious cities like Ghent, where you have medieval castles and uh, cathedrals to look at, you can go do that. But after that, you're kind of bored, and then you think, well, might as well go shopping. Now, this calls into question the current vogue uh, initiated by the scarcely disinterested CEO of Google, namely Eric Schmidt, of referring to the digital world as the attention economy. Because if we follow Benjamin, the goal of this particular mode of capitalism is, in fact, a somewhat deeper layer of the mind. Now, what interests Benjamin is Freud's hypothesis that that which becomes conscious cannot also become a memory trace. Uh, and again, I quote, he says, in Freud's view, consciousness as such receives no memory traces, whatever, 
but has another important function, namely protection against stimuli. In Freud's view, protection against stimuli is just as vitally important as the reception of stimuli, and his whole theory of dreams turns on the hypothesis that their essential purpose is to manage excess stimuli by repeating it and working it until it can be experienced and mastery over it obtained. Similarly, in everyday life, as Freud's discussion of his grandson's cotton reel game explains, we use rituals to gain control over otherwise uncontrollable thoughts and feelings. In effect, repetition is a form of training, uh, or what Benjamin called shock defence, that enables us, at the level of the unconscious, to internalise the hitherto indigestible stimulus and make sense of it without ever having to think about it. This, Freud suggests, is what his grandson did with his Fort Dar game. Uh, it was his way of dealing with his mother's uncontrolled presences and absences, uh, and behind that, the loss of his father, who was at the front. At the extreme edge of this spectrum of behaviours is the schizophrenic, who is bombarded by so many stimuli, both from within and without, that they eventually are forced to abandon even the attempt at mastery. In Deleuze and Guattari's language, the schizophrenic then retreats to their body without organs, a notion they borrowed from Artaud, of course, sealing themselves off from the world and effectively making themselves shockproof. Now, I want to suggest that boredom functions something like this. It is simultaneously a walling off from external stimuli and a negation of internal stimuli. It is in this sense that it is a defence against the present. It is both a rejection of a situation and a protection against it. To be bored waiting for a plane uh, to update and simplify, a great deal of course, Heidegger, uh, means that time has reasserted itself in a paradoxical way. On the one hand, it has lengthened. The moment never seems to pass. It becomes bloated, expanding without end. But on the other hand, we do nothing to shorten it. Indeed, we refuse to pass time and thus make time pass. In such a state we are, as Krakow puts it, impervious to the blandishments of capitalism. No commodity, however bedazzling, can entice us out of this funk once we've sunk into it. And no entertainment is sufficiently entertaining to force us to relent and make time pass again. Now, as Heidegger's brief discussion of waiting at a train station suggests, we fall into the funk of boredom because we feel time has been stolen from us by a space that seems to have somehow let us down. But what more could we expect of the station, is Heidegger's question. His answer is uh, very much of his own time. The empty platform, as miserable as it is, is all one can expect because it does precisely what it is supposed to do. And to sort of distort high diggers slightly, he's basically saying, get over it, you're at a train station, that's what you're supposed to do, wait for trains, so, you know, shut up. Uh, I, I don't think he put it exactly like that, he took several more pages, but I'm kind of, you know, riffing a little bit here to just kind of tidy him up a bit. Um, but today this line of thinking makes no sense to us. Uh, we've been taught to expect that the last thing a train or a, a, a train station or an airport or even an art gallery should be, is purely functional, a place to do nothing more than wait. We've learned to think of the absence of our train or plane as a welcome opportunity to relax, to shop, to eat or to be entertained. And so many airports now advertise their space as being so amazingly awesome that you should just go there even if you don't have to fly anywhere. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody's actually been persuaded by that line of advertising, but nonetheless that's the view that they would like us to have. And anyway, if all else fails, we have our smartphones. So how could we be bored? In the screen age, boredom has been as thoroughly delegitimated as the welfare state. Any moment or place where boredom might creep in is saturation bombed by media messaging. TVs, radio, canned music, billboards, electronic message boards, not to mention our phones, which do the same thing under the guise of social media so that we don't even notice we're being blitzed by marketers. Um, as one of my friends uh, bent... Sorison has argued, uh, have you ever stopped and thought, how did Facebook get to be a company that's worth $200 billion uh, on the basis of only 4,000 employees? It's because all of you are slaves. You spend hours every day making Facebook interesting, doing the work of making this the best website in the world for free. Not only that, you pay money to your cell phone provider in order to be able to do that. So you're worse than slaves because they just gave their labour. You give your labour and your money. 
And that's social media, right? Social media has enacted the hugest capture of labour, of time, of investment and energy that we've ever seen in history. You know, the people who built the pyramids, they would laugh at us because they only gave up their labour. But the other thing that's really interesting is to watch people with cell phones. Um, and I certainly, you know, I'm as bad as anybody else with cell phones. Um, and so I, I don't hold this up as being something that I don't do, that you do, by no means. But there is a kind of interesting emerging etiquette of using cell phones. Uh, and it's something that I've been watching for quite a long time. But I remember when I was in China watching Frederick Jameson give a talk. And this was in 2004, so the kind of infancy of cell phones. The whole audience, not a single one of them, it seemed to us, turned off their cell phones. So it was a room full of Chinese scholars. They had their cell phones. They were blaring, constantly going off. No one had it on silent, nothing. They just, you know. But what was really interesting is not only with that, we, you know, we, us, you know, uh, Westerners were sitting there aghast at their kind of inconsiderateness, letting their phones ring. But they also answered them, which seemed even more kind of beyond the realm of the possible. But it was polite to do so, provided you did this. So you could talk on your phone as much as you wanted, provided you, <laughs> you, you were below the level of the desk or chair in front of you. And so there's this marvellous etiquette of this device has entered our lives, but we don't know what the fuck to do with it. It's like, what is this thing? And so we're making up all the rules as we go along. And I think that's what's extraordinary about the phones. And I don't think we've properly grasped just how much they're changing everything. Airports, art galleries, our, our very experience. So one of the things that has always struck me is that behaviour that passes for normal today is in many cases indistinguishable from the key clinical symptoms of schizophrenia. We listen to the disembodied voices of advertisements all day and happily do as they instruct. We buy this, we buy that, we think this, we think that. We say that schizophrenics are crazy because they respond to the voices in their head, but we do it too, we do it all the time. Our digital devices bombard us with messages and stimuli and we think nothing of it. But the reality, uh, as research is beginning to show, is that it is transforming us individually, culturally and socially in ways that we haven't fully mapped. Not only that, we put in headphones so as to block out the rest of the world and give our fullest attention to the disembodied voices on our devices. Should someone try to talk to us when we're thus engaged, we consider it rude and, and you know, resent the fact that we've been interrupted, which is to say it is no longer rude or impolite to actively ignore one's fellow humans. Now, boring art is another matter altogether. Now, with typical prescience, Jameson noted this paradox some 25 years ago. It is, he says, a paradox one can get used to. If a boring text can also be good or interesting, as we now put it, uh, although I think every academic on the planet knows that if you say something is interesting, you actually mean it's boring, but you're too polite to say it's boring. Um, Exciting texts which incorporate diversion, distraction, temporal commodification can also sometimes be bad uh, or degraded, to use Frankfurt School language. Now, Jameson could be talking about smartphones here, and, and this is what I'm getting at. Art, we might suggest, is compelled now to be boring in this context if it is to be interesting, but not at the same time distracting, if it is to catch and hold our attention and draw our conscious mind into a conversation with it. Art that bedazzles will no longer be able to distinguish itself from the ceaseless pulsations of stimulus issuing from digital devices we surround ourselves with. Even digital art must, in this regard, endeavour to be boring or else find itself subsumed into the morass of social media. If galleries have become stark places with bare walls, and subdued lighting, it is undoubtedly in an attempt to calm the storm of distractions audiences today carry with them. Uh, and I think this was a part that Elm Green and Dragset didn't really like, that me talking about art being boring and, and implying that their art had to be boring in order to be good. Um, I think as artists they took exception to that idea. Uh, and maybe fair enough. But it's an interesting question for me because when we carry so much distraction in our pockets... For art to now be distracting, it seems it puts it on the same continuum of what we have on our cell phone. So how does art puncture that new continuum of constant, intense stimulation? How does it do a new kind of thing? And it can't just be more dazzling, because there's nothing that art can do dazzle-wise that your cell phone can't also do. 
uh, and won't soon be able to do if it can't do it already. So what digital technology is constantly doing is transforming the nature of what we think of as an interesting form of perception. Uh, and so that's, what, that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make, that maybe boring is the new interesting. So ours is a schizo society then, so distracted by media that we don't even notice that being connected is a new form of atomism, which is a step beyond Sartre's seriality. Paradoxically, though, it is our connectedness that disconnects us from the world. In the space of only a handful of years, less than an evolutionary blink of the eye, the mobile phone has gone from being present at hand, uh, for me to mangle Heidegger again, to being fully ready to hand, meaning it has passed from being something that is merely of interest, as perhaps an idea or concept might be, to being something that is a practical tool we use intuitively without conscious thought. This trajectory is, of course, the one mapped out for us by the designers and manufacturers. The great technological revolution of the early 70s, uh, when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were just university dropouts, came about because these guys could see that computers had the potential to, to be machines that people used in their homes and in their everyday lives. The prevailing view until then had been that computers were too complicated and too expensive for anything but commercial, military or geek applications. But even then, they had no idea of just how pervasive digital technology could and would become once they helped to let the genie out the bottle. The digital revolution has unleashed a veritable tidal wave of digital innovation that has led to the development of the World Wide Web, uh, and some of us forget that you know, the internet didn't exist as, as recently as 20 years ago. Uh, on that point, I, I will never forget, I, one of my, when I was a postgraduate student in the 90s, uh, one of the lecturers came along to some meeting, rather, and he said, I've you know, wait for it, everybody, I've got this fabulous news. And we're like, what? What could it be? And he said, the Vice-Chancellor has agreed that we can all have email in our offices. And, like, at that moment, if we had known, we would have been like, no, fuck, anything but that. Let's have email that it's some, like, a well at the middle of the university that you only have to visit once a year or something. But to let it into our offices like a tidal wave and then to carry it around in our pockets, I mean, what the fuck were we thinking? Um, and so that's what technology is like. It has kind of hit us like a storm we weren't prepared for. We keep thinking that all these new things are going to be wonderful and amazing and they're going to liberate us, but somehow they always seem to enslave us. Uh, and so on that fabulous note, I will end. Thank you.